Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are on the Arab Shabbat, uh, the evening before the Shabbat, and um, we're going to be doing the uh, some reading, just a little bit of study tonight. Welcome uh, to our service meeting. Okay, uh, so uh, the Bible tells us that Noah um, says, uh, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just and perfect perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with Yahweh. Okay, so we're going to go now to Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 to 1132. So, uh, this is Genesis chapter 6. We're starting in, in uh, verse 9. We're going to go to 22. And so remember that in the first portion that we did, this talked about the creation. It talked about Adam. It, it, it told us about how Adam was given a uh, charge uh, of creation, looking after the animals, tending to the garden, uh, you know, and eating of the fruit of the tree of life, which gave him eternal sustenance. And then uh, a proper help meet was not found for Adam until Yahweh gave him a special help meet and took woman from him. Uh, I've got a really nice picture that you can see in that last recording about that. Now, uh, and as we shifted in that chapter, we saw that mankind was progressively getting worse, especially by the time we get to chapter 6. We talked a lot about how the book of Enoch goes into great detail about these beings, these, these uh, heavenly beings, which Jude, the book of Jude says, left their first estate. And they came down to Mount Hermon, and they made a pact with one another, uh, and they basically had relations, sexual relations with human women, and they produced these giants, these grotesque creatures. And that was one of the reasons why Yahweh, because all the generations were being corrupted of mankind, they were being destroyed. These creatures were killing uh, so much and causing such violence. Uh, or uh, they were turning mankind to wicked ways, which as we read in the book of uh, Enoch, they were teaching mankind about technology, not for their good, not for their for their benefit, but that they might uh, uh, take power and oppress over other people. And so, but Noah is is singled out in that entire picture as a righteous man who was perfect in all his generations. So we begin here in Genesis six nine through twenty two. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just and perfect in his generations. That means he had no Nephilim intermix going on. And Noah walked with Elohim. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. Remember, we learned in the book of Enoch that one of these fallen beings, these uh, like watchers, they could be called, or you might even say they're like fallen angels, uh, which left their first estate, uh, was teaching mankind the skill and art of weaponry for the purpose of oppressing. And so it, it says here the earth was filled with violence. But not just that, these creatures that they spawned were, were um, causing such violence too. And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Notice this, through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the earth. And this is now his destruction to Noah. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, woods that shall make in the ark and shall pitch it within without with pitch to make it, make it watertight, right? And this is the fashion which you shall make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. And a window shall you make to the ark, and in the cubit you shall finish it above, and the ark of the door shall you set in the side thereof. So it's going to have a huge side door and a ramp, uh, as we uh, see later on in the narrative. A window shall you make to the ark, and in the cubit shall you finish it above. The door of the ark shall be set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third story. So this is a three-story. This is a monstrous boat. And, and remember... We learned in the last portion that it had never rained. So think about this. It had never rained, and here was 
Noah being instructed to create this monstrous thing that Yahweh had given him the sort of the the understanding to do. And imagine the faith that it would have taken to do that. And so uh, he says here, uh, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under the heavens, and everything that is in the earth shall die. I notice this, that he doesn't say anything about the sea creatures here, because they're already living in the water. But with you I will establish my covenant, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your daughter and your sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall you bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Of the fowls of every kind and of the cattle of every kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Now this has to do with clean. And you shall take uh, thee of all the food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all Elohim commanded him, and so did and so did he. So uh, that begins that um, that section there. So uh, as we continue on, we'll also find out that the uh, it was two by two, um, and then it was seven pairs. So it was like two pairs. And later on in the interval, we'll, we'll find out that there was two pairs per unclean, and then there were seven pairs of the clean, probably because uh, for food that was necessary after the Lord, because everything was destroyed. All vegetation was destroyed. And Yahweh said to Noah, Come you and all thy house in the ark, for, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast you shall take to thee by seven. See this, what I just mentioned to you? Uh, wait a minute here. Here it is. Take to thee by sevens. Okay, so seven clean the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two. So this, this gives us an indication that Yahweh's distinction between clean and unclean was well before the so-called law of Moses. Okay, well before that. Remember how we established that the Sabbath was well before the Jews were even Jews, before there was even anything known as a Jew, or anything known as the Exodus and the, and the trials and tribulations and so on, and then the the deliverance out of Egypt into the wilderness where Yahweh met them. And so um, uh, so we have uh, seven of every clean and two by two of every unclean. The male is female, of the fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. Interesting. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that Yahweh commanded him. Now, this was a monstrous task, mind you. This, this was not just a rowboat or something. <laughs> Forget about the whole idea that it, there that it was no, no, uh, you know, no rain. That oh, there was only a mist coming up from the ground to water the plants. Uh, but and that the faith, but then when you figure the monstrosity of this task, and not only that, but when you think about gathering all the animals and the birds, I mean, how did they get the birds? You know, the birds are up there flying around. That must have been quite a task as well to get two, uh, seven pairs of every type of bird. And uh, now notice this: Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So I think scholars have said that he was working on this for about a hundred years. So think about this here, he's 500 years old, but also remember that longevity was much more back then. And so now they're finished with this enormous project. Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of the clean beasts and of the beasts that are not clean and of the fowls and everything that creeps upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as Elohim had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind 
and every bird of every sort. So those categories, notice the categorization here. After their kind, it was a very orderly process. And they went in unto Noah and the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as Elohim had commanded them, and Yahweh shut him in. Notice this. They didn't shut the door. Yahweh shut that door and made sure it was fast. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth, and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail. Now, uh, exactly, their scholars have some dispute as exactly what this cubit is, but it must have been quite deep to be able to even support such a monstrous boat. Uh, in other words, without it, uh, given the weight of it, without of it hitting the bottom. So it, it must have been way up there, you know, if you if you were to measure. And the mountains were covered. Imagine that, the mountains. And all the flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast. Now, this of beast, it could be, this could be a reference to um, the Nephilim, the giants, these monstrous creatures that these uh, watchers with human women spawned. And of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every, every man, all whose nostrils are the breath of life, all that was in the dry land died. And every creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils is the breath of life and all that was in the dry land. Okay, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive and his family, this is inferred. And they that were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Now, we don't know just how high the mountains were then. Uh, it, the, the topography of the earth could have been very different from what we have now. We have exceedingly high heights, say we want to talk about Mount Everest or something like that. But before the flood, we don't know if there was these huge differentials between what was down below and the height of a mountain. Remember that the topography was greatly changed. And how do we know this? Because in the prophecies, it states that when, when, when before the day of Yahweh comes and his return, Every mountain shall be made low, and, and, and the, the rough places shall be made smooth. So when Yahweh comes, he's going to change again the topography of the earth. And so uh, this, is, this is also uh, something to consider. And then Elohim remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. So remember, 150 days, they're on this. And you know what? It probably wasn't just a calm water experience. There may have been enormous waves. Have you ever seen videos on YouTube of these tankers that are going through these cold regions with these, I mean, just the waves. They look something out of earth, out of otherworldly. The, the sheer size and the violence of that mass of water that's just huge. And it's tossing those enormous ships. You see, imagine the ride must have been incredibly bumpy as well because of all of this flood of water coming, both from down below, from above, and, and uh, you know, just the forces of nature must have been incredible. So, uh, so after these 150 days, uh, the waters began to wane a little bit. The fountains also, the deep, and the windows of heavens were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated, and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, there's significance here. Exactly, um, I don't really have anything for you guys right now with regarding the, the uh, significance uh, of this. Okay, uh, but uh, there's uh, when whenever you see a timing thing here, there's a significance. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, and the tenth month, and on the first day of the month, where the tops of the mountains seen 
So slowly receding, now the tops of the mountains could be seen. And it came to pass the end of 40 days, and Noah opened the window of the ark, which he made, and he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro, until the waters were dried up from off the earth. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the earth. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him in the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Okay, so not enough land yet to be able to disembark. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled in unto him into the ark, and he stayed yet another seven days. Interesting. Notice the, notice the perfection of cycles. Seven, seven, seven. And again he set forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth, because obviously the bird got the branch from somewhere. And she stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not yet un again unto him anymore. Now, look at this quite of an interesting process here that he uses to determine this because she doesn't, she must have found a place to rest. So now he knows there's got to be more land that's showing up. It came to pass in the 600th first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the face of the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And then Elohim spoke unto Moses, uh, to, not Moses, Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, you and your wife and your sons, and thy son's wives with you. Because remember, uh, we learn from other places that Ham, Japheth, and Shem each had a wife. And there's a lot of teaching that has to go into uh, the idea of who... who uh, Ham's wife is, but that's very deep, and we're, we don't, this is beyond the scope of our study this time. But it says, bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all the flesh, both fowl and of the cattle, and every creepy thing that creeps upon the earth. They may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. This is where we get also get the command, be fruitful and multiply. This is the second time this has happened. In the garden, it said, be fruitful and multiply. In this period, be fruitful and multiply. And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wives, and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth. And after their kinds went forth out of the ark, and Noah built an altar unto Yahweh, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Yahweh smelled a sweet savor, and Yahweh said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more. Uh, every living thing as I have done, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So what, what was the reason, reason for, what was the reason that all of this happened in the first place is because the very line of Messiah, which was the entire redemption of mankind, and I would wager the redemption of the entire earth was predicated upon a righteous line being allowed to exist through history. And these fallen angels messed that up and threatened that to such a degree and corrupted the earth to such a degree that Yahweh had to do something drastic. And uh, you can't... Uh, uh, listen to these pagans and these atheists and these agnostics out there and say, he's such a mean Elohim, because they don't even understand the seriousness of what was happening and why Yahweh. Also, this is the reason why many of the Israelites were commanded to wipe out peoples that had been, and remember it says, and also afterward there was an infiltration. Remember it says that in Genesis, we'll, we'll see that somewhere. Okay, so, uh, so these, this, these angelic infiltration, and this corruption of flesh happened, as it says first in Genesis 6, but it says, and also afterward. It's just a very small phrase, but there's a lot in there. Okay, uh, so Genesis 9. And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all the moves upon the earth, and upon all the fish of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Now, I think what he means here is not to abuse, but to look after like a shepherd looks after sheep. And yes, to harvest, but not in the way that mankind is doing now, where they're just killing, 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 killing. And certainly not as they did to the buffalo, where they were just killing, 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 killing back in the days of the, of the um, you know, the cowboy days. Uh, that's, that, that is not the intent here. Yahweh wants 
it's and really when you think about the native american uh ethic of only killing what you need for food and sustenance okay that's the kind of shepherding that the father wants of his people every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you and every now this actually um i think when you look in the hebrew this has to do with like cattle cattle and as the green herb i have given you all things but flesh with the life thereof which the blood thereof shall you not eat so you have to slaughter it properly and surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will i require it and at the hand of man at the hand of every man's brother will i require the life of man now this is one of the reasons why notice how he says by the by uh, will i require it if a beast kills someone and back in the day even in america this was followed and in some places, perhaps in the United States, this is followed. For example, um, if a bear mauls a hiker and kills them, then the uh, back in the proper day, they would go and they would kill that animal because they shed blood, you see. Uh, and, and also, uh, because of the great violence that happened before the flood, this, this is now put into place again, okay? Uh, so, um, whoso shed man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of Elohim made he man and you here to get it three times now, be you fruitful and multiply. Isn't that something? Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And Elohim spoke to Noah and to his sons with him saying, and I behold, I establish my covenant with you. This is the Noahide covenant with your seed after you, with every living thing that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and every beast of the earth with you. For all the guava of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Now, the caveat is we find out in the narrative of the scripture that he's going to cleanse the earth with fire because we're going to enter days just like the days of Noah, which I believe we are encountering now. Okay, but never another flood again. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And Elohim said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. So this is a rainbow. So remember that, that conditions were changed. All of that, that water that was up above on the firmament had come down. And we'll also discover that the lifespan of man was greatly reduced. Remember, before the flood, we see that these it was nothing for these guys to be living 800 years, 900 years. Now, you're lucky if you get 120 years. You're lucky. And there's a lot of reason for that. There's, there are, um, there are um, environmental reasons for that. Okay, so he's going to give them this uh, rainbow as a token of this covenant. And it says, and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. So uh, we notice that in everything that Yahweh does, Satan tries to twist it and pervert it, right? So, so because of corruption of flesh, because of sin, this great punishment came and then the promise after the punishment of the survivors is that he would put this bow. Now, what are they doing with the rainbow? What are they doing with the corrupt of the earth now that it becomes so horribly corrupt? What are they doing with the rainbow? Okay, uh, LGBTQ, anyone? You see, uh, everything is, the devil tries to pervert and twist everything. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now Elohim said, Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Interesting. These are the three sons of Noah. Of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Okay, so he liked his wine, it must be. And he drank of his wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now, there's an entire theology with this one verse right here, okay? And uh, I'm not going to get into that too deeply, but it, it has to do with a sexual impropriety that happened. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers without, and, Ham, and Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it both 
laid it upon both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. Uh, and now when this says father's nakedness, it could have to do with an act that was inappropriate. Uh, and that the, the, uh, the, the after effect of the nakedness, there's an aspect of nakedness there, I do believe. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of the servant shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh Elohim of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Elohim shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So uh, there's been a lot of, of, of uh, how shall we say, um, uh, a question as to, okay, so, so who is Japheth, who is Shem, who is Ham? Uh, now, the book of Jasher seems to define this more accurately, but I don't necessarily put stock in Jasher in the same way that I might put stock in Genesis. There is a lot of fanciful stories in, Gen in Jasher, uh, if you've had, ever had a chance to read it. Some of it's quite fanciful. And so, uh, but it, it basically... Uh, gives more details according to that resource. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Look at that. He made it to 900 years. Okay, let's see where we, what we got here. We got two more chapters. Let me, may not be as high. Okay. And then vegetarian animals show, um, what is this here? Should be food for us. Vegetarian animal should be food for us. Yeah, right. They were a vegetarian before. You're right, uh, Jerry. And now remember that the conditions were changed. The environmental conditions. I can prove from Scripture that the seasons were greatly, ex the extremity of the seasons were greatly enhanced. The extremity of it. Uh, I can prove that um, uh, there are, there was, um, uh, for example, uh, they have uh, done testing on the nails from the, for what they believe to be the ark that was found. And they find that uh, there was no, uh, no way to forge this metal uh, now. Uh, the heat that would be required would be so enormous. So it's been postulated based upon the composition of these nails. And I've seen this in, an, in a uh, creation science uh, evangelism video okay so i'm just kind of giving you the brush strokes but the idea was that there may have very well been about 30 percent more oxygen and double the air pressure now this would also account for the fact that that dinosaurs when you look at the dimensions of their nostrils in our current environment they would have suffocated uh they would have suffocated because they could the, the, the phys, if, when you look at the physics they could not have drawn in enough oxygen or the enormity of their size, okay? But if you doubled the air pressure and you had about 30% more oxygen in the environment, you see, this could very well contribute to the longevity of lifespan and the, and the, the size of these, uh, these, these creatures, like which would be called today dinosaurs, okay? Uh, and, and so it might also explain why uh, after this, when that canopy was down, more radiation coming down, therefore the lifespan of man is now greatly reduced, okay? Uh, so that's uh, something to think about. Uh, that could be, it's been postulated as such that way. Okay, uh, so let's go here. Uh, now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were born uh, sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Jabin, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras. Now, when you, if you would really study these, you learn a lot because some of these names are mentioned in the prophets. <clears throat> For example, Magog and Gomer and Meshach and Tubal are mentioned in prophecies relative to great battles that are going to happen. Uh, so could this be uh, perhaps Oriental countries like China, Japan, so on? The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rephath, and Tugarma, and the sons of Jabin, uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Ketum, and Dodadim, 
Uh, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families and their nations, and the sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayim. There's Egypt right there, Mitzrayim. And Put and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, and Ra'amah, Sabteha, and the sons of Ra'amah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. Now this guy is an important guy. If you read in the book of Jubilees and the book of Jasher, those two, they mention a lot about Nimrod, and he did a lot of wickedness in the earth. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, when it says mighty one, it could very well mean that he got access to fallen watcher knowledge. And a lot of the uh, uh, extracurricular stories seem to, you know, these, these extra stories from these other, uh, they're not considered a scripture necessarily, but they're sort of writings of the rabbis and so on. Uh, sort of think this. He was a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Now, when this says before Yahweh, it means that he was arrogant, I believe. This is my, my thought on this, but if you have a different thought, then put it down there. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yahweh, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erek Akkad Kalna in the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Ashur, think of Syria, think of Assyria, and build at Nineveh. Now, there is an ancient city that we even know about. Jonah uh, was sent to Nineveh, right? And the city of Rehoboth and Kela, and reason between Nineveh and Kala, the same as a great city. And Mitzrayim begat Ludim. So we have the Egyptians here, Mitzrayim, and the Anamim, and the Lahabim, and then uh, looks like the Naphtuhim, and the uh, Pathrusim, and the Kalhusim, out of whom come the Philistines, and the Kaphtarim. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn in Heth. Now, now uh, Tyre, Tyr, and Sidon were consummate idol people, right? But these are not good. These are not, you know, they're not perfect at all. They're generations, are they? These are people that are totally given over to corruption and idolatry. And the Jebusite and the Amorite and the Gergesite, remember we read about them that the Israelites encountered during the days of Joshua. And the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterward with the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. The Canaanites, they became so wicked in the what is now the Holy Land. And in the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, and thou comest to Gerar unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh-oh, there's another infamous one. Adma Zeboim. And they're missing one, uh, Bella. Uh, these are, and that Bella, that fifth one is mentioned in, um, uh, I think it might be Jasher Jubilees, one of those. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues and their countries and in their nations. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber. Now this Eber here, this is interesting because it comes from the Hebrew word avar, which means to cross over. Uh, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born, the children of Shem, Elam, and Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. Okay, the, the children of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gesher, and Mosh, and Arphaxad begat Sela, Sela begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg. Now notice this, for in his days was the earth divided. Very curious statement, right? Now there's two theories. Okay, I'll give you, uh, the first theory is, is that uh, the, the uh, earth was such that it was all one continent, and because of the stressors of all the water that came down, they split. Now, here's, here's the second one. The second thought is, is that, and this is what's recounted in one of those books, Jasher or Jubilees, one of those, where it talks about how uh, there was dispute and there was some wars going on between the clans of these, these families. And they all came to Noah to get it sorted out. And so uh, basically they hashed out what the borders should be. And that they were strictly commanded by Moses, or, or <laughs> I keep saying Moses, Noah, to um, to stay within the borders and not, you know, try to conquer everyone you know, that wasn't in their allotted piece of land. Okay, so that was the idea. And his brother's name was Juktan, and Juktan began Almodad and Shelef and Hazar, Mava and Jera and Hadoram and Uzal and Dikla and Obol and uh, Abimael and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah. Now, we've, some of these are mentioned in the prophecies. 
Jobab, and all these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Sephir, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after the generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Now, why, why go through all the trouble to write down all the names of these families? Because uh, and there's a lot of study that goes into tracing these families, and then how do we interpret prophecies relative to these families, do you see? Uh, so there's this is um, you know a useful study, but it's somewhat arduous, probably. Could be a lifetime study, and you might still might not get all. Okay, I think this might be our last chapter. All right, so, and the whole earth was in one language and one speech. Think about this. What was that language and what was that speech? I submit to you that it was a primordial form of Hebrew. Now, what script was used? I don't know. It probably was not the post-Babylonian that Hebrew today in the modern script uses. In fact, I think I could confidently say no, it was not. Was it similar to this script here behind my, my, uh, my face here, this picture, this background picture? This is a paleo rendering of yod heh vav -Hey. Okay, you see the difference, how it looks different from the post-Babylonian script that you might see in modern Hebrew, okay? But they were all speaking the same language. Isn't that something? And it came to pass, they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said one to another, go to, let us build brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, uh, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Uh-oh. Let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. So this is the first concerted effort to organize and to do things the way they thought should be done, the way they saw fit, and it was departure from what Yahweh, in, in his, through Noah, in the division of such, that they should all respect each other's. And so they wanted to build an empire, okay, essentially, and even to challenge heaven. Okay, and Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of the men builded, and Yahweh said, Behold, the people is one, and they have one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them. Think about that. Think about that claim. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. What has hindered technological development around the world more than anything? I submit to you it's because there's so many different cultures and so many different languages. But you can notice in the UN, when the UN representatives are together, They'll speak in their language, and then there, there must be rooms of translators translating, you see, to other representatives so everything is that's being spoken, they know what's going on, and then look at the organization, the fast pace by which they are coming up with plans, and this is the same sort of thing that Yahweh want to put a stop to because man's plans, especially when they get together, and they all become like one mind. They're never, they're never respectful of Yahweh's ways. If anything, they're looking to depart from Yahweh's ways. I think we can confidently say that, right? And so here's the problem. These angels come down, and they see mankind doing this, and they're aided by the fact that they all speak the same language. And so now nothing that they put their hand to do, which is implied evil, that they're doing evil, uh, which they imagine to do, nothing will be withheld from them. Now, here's the angel speaking. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Pretty simple solution, huh? But it took a miracle to do it. Therefore, is the name of it called Babel. Think of like babbling. Not making any sense, babbling. Because Yahweh did there confound the language of all the earth, and thence did Yahweh scatter them abroad, abroad upon the face of all the earth. And these are the generations. Okay, so now it's, 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 it's this very curious story, and then it sh shifts again to the generation stuff. 
These are the generations of Shem, Ham was 100 years old and begat Arphax said two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphax said 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphax said lived five and 30 years and begat Salah. And Arphax said lived after he begat Salah 403 years and begat sons and daughters. They're having a lot of sons and daughters, aren't they? And Salah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Salah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived 430 years and begat Peleg. Remember that in Peleg, the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ru. And Peleg lived after he begat Ru 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Ru lived 2 and 30 years and begat Sarug. And Ru lived after he begat Sarug 209. Seven years and begat sons and daughters, and Sarug lived thirty years and begat Nahor. Now this guy is interesting. We see him referenced Nahor, and Sarug lived after he begat Nahor two hundred years and begat sons and daughters, and Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. Uh oh, now we're getting really familiar, aren't we? We all know who Terah is, right? And Nahor lived after he begat Tehor, uh, Terah one hundred and nineteen years and begat sons and daughters, and Terah lived seventy years. And here it is, and begat Abram. Remember? The same guy that was renamed Abraham. And he had three brothers, Nahor and Haran. Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot. We're going we're gonna to talk a lot about Abraham the next time we get around to uh, the Torah portion next week. Almighty willing. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Herad, Haran begat Lot. Remember? That Lot also went with Abraham when they left. I don't want to spoil the story. And probably all of you know it anyway, but this is for the audience out there. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity. I don't know how did this happen. Nimrod was the cause of it. And really the cause of it was because he did not have faith in Yahweh, according to the narrative. Now, this is not in Genesis, but it's in, uh, I think it might be in Jubilees in Ur of the Chaldees, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah, Sarai, or rather Sarai, was barren, and she had no child. Now remember, she was renamed Sarah, just like Abram was renamed Abraham, as we find further on later and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth from them from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. Now, this entire story is greatly expanded upon in uh, Jasher, I think it is. Uh, and it's quite a, a story. I don't know how much of it is absolutely... Uh, you know, whether there's there was a literary license, uh, you know, it, it just does seem to be places in Jasher where they seem to add a little uh, extra. They don't need to add, but uh, the basic story could be true, possibly. Uh, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Okay, so uh, that is... Um, the Genesis section uh, for that, that covers Noah. And when we think about this, why do we study these things? Because the Bible tells us the thing which hath been is the thing which shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. Now, also, there's another principle. Yahweh will do nothing except he revealeth it unto his servants, the prophets. Okay. And then there's another principle, declaring the end from the beginning, the things which Yahweh intends to do. So why do we study these things that happened thousands of years ago? Because, guess what? While Yahweh might do it a little differently in how he deals with mankind, there's going to be themes that are going to repeat. They're going to repeat. Remember, even Messiah established this when he said, it's just as it was in the days of the uh, of Noah. What did he say? Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. So that's how bad. If you want to wonder why things are getting so bad, you're you're getting a taste of what it was before the flood. You see, and now, I mean, what are they doing? Genetic manipulation. Satanism is everywhere. 
Even Tucker Carlson, you follow Tucker Carlson? He actually came out recently and talked about a demonic, satanic attack that he underwent. And you know what? I've read other accounts, too, where literally people are under attack, spiritual attack, sat sat satanic attack. They are messing with the genetic code. They are doing all of these horrible things. And, 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 and it becomes very um, reminiscent when we speak of Noah and the fact that he was perfect in all of his generations. And they are literally trying to make what's perfect imperfect and pollute it and corrupt it in our day. And so this is another aspect of just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And my friends, I am sad and yet joyful at this time to report to you that yes, the enemy is going to come in like a flood. This is why we're seeing the, the increase of evil. But guess what? Yahweh is going to raise up a standard to stand against it. And that's the hope we have to hold on to when we see these horrific stories being recounted or we see news stories of things that we would have never conceived would have been done or accepted by wicked society, yet are openly practiced and even vaunted and prideful, uh, you know, displays and causing great harm to our Heavenly Father's sheep in his pasture. And you're always going to deal with this situation, and all we have to do is hang tight. Hang tight, my friends. Hold on to your seat seat, because the ride could get a little bumpy, but our Heavenly Father will bring us through it. Okay?